two. Okay, I'm going to start when I'm ready. Okay, so um, my my uh, disclaimer is that this is being recorded, and I think that when you join, you were given the option to stay with it recorded. You may leave your audio or video off, but at Mary Washington, we have very interactive classes, especially in the business school. So it is is um, an expectation, if you will, if that you would at least take your video mute off so that I can see faces versus just seeing a bunch of names, if you're comfortable doing that, because I'm gonna be asking questions and I'd like some feedback and I'd like for you to um, participate in this because if, I, if I'm just going to lecture at you, that's not what we do at Mary Washington and, and it doesn't give you a real sense of what it would be like. It, I'm not gonna ask you any questions that are gonna be so hard you can't answer them, I promise. It's not like I'm gonna make you embarrassed or humiliated because of your, your answers. So, and you can certainly only participate if you want to. But uh, I welcome you today. Uh, this is the College of Business uh, mock lecture, if you will. I'm Lynn Richardson, I'm the Dean of the College of Business. And some of you have been with me before on some of our open house events. Um, and, and, and you've met me and, and a couple of our students there. But today we're just going to do a mock lecture. And so I have a PhD in marketing from the University of Alabama. And um, before I became a Dean, I taught principles of marketing a lot over the years, which is a required class for all business majors. Doesn't matter you know, whether you're doing accounting or, or marketing or whatever. Everybody takes this because in business, what we want you to do is, is, is see all of the different aspects or facets of business and then figure out kind of how they work together to, um, to, to deliver products and, and, and services to the world. So today I thought what we would do is do something a little bit out of the ordinary. We're going to pretend that we are a brand manager or a product manager, we can call it either one, for Rolex watches. Now, um, let me just ask people, do you know what a Rolex watch is? Do you know anything about a Rolex watch? Anybody? They're a high-end watch. Do what? Uh, I said they're a high-end watch. A high-end watch. So yes, and so most of us in our lifetime probably will not own a Rolex watch, at least not a real one. I actually bought one in China on the streets one time, two for $10. So I was pretty sure that was not a real Rolex watch, right? But uh, we're gonna just talk about the, um, the decisions we would have to make if we were a brand manager for Rolex watch. So a brand manager basically makes all of the marketing strategy decisions for a Rolex watch or for any product that they're a brand manager for. But today our thing is Rolex watch. So. So we're going to, let's see if I can get my thing to next. We're going to, um, to assume that we're making all these decisions. And I guess, uh, I think it's very important to remind you that we would not be making the decisions in a vacuum. I mean, if I'm really the brand or product manager for Rolex, nobody's gonna give me total responsibility and let me make every decision. I'm gonna work with a lot of other people but today, for the purposes of our little mock lecture, we're going to simplify things and say, it's all about you, friend. You're the person who's going to make all of these decisions. So, so we know a little bit that Rolex watches are high-end luxury items, and um, we need to figure out what our target market is first, because a marketing strategy, basically, we figure out what our target market is, and then we figure out the answers to four, what we call the four Ps of marketing, which we'll get to in a minute. But first we start with our target market. So if you assume this little pie chart here with people standing on it, interestingly, they all look like men, that would not be necessarily true, but that's the, the slide I could find or the, the graphic I could find. Um, if this is all, all of the people of the world, think about who we are going to try to reach to sell our luxury watch. So I'd like for you to, um, share a, 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 a type of either a demographic or a psychographic or an occupational thing. So an age, a gender, um, occupation, what does is, what is this person in our target market do to make their money? Those kinds of things. Because if the world is this big, we've got to shrink it down to try to identify the people who really might be interested in our product. Yes, I could, I could um, do advertising and promotions to the world, but I'd be wasting my, my money. 
you're going to be given, if you're a, a product manager, you're going to be giving, given a budget to, to, for your brand management work, right? And so you're not going to have all the money in the world to reach everybody on this pie chart. You're going to have to narrow the, the target down to the target so that you can um, identify specifically, or at least pretty specifically, who, um, who it, you're going to try to reach and all. So, so um, Ellie says it's CEOs, uh, Mia says investors, people, uh, Julia B says people who like to make, who make a lot of money, like CEOs or movie stars, the top one percenters, well-known athletes, okay? Um, men that work in a professional setting, high-income business execs. So, so we're getting some things with occupations. We've also got me, the word men there, uh, men middle-aged, uh, all right, so let's start with that. It's, uh, don't put anything else in chat for just a second. Let's talk about the gender issue. Um, how many of you think that only men are in the uh, target market for Rolex watches? Does anybody, anybody think only men? I see, I only have four of you on my screen, so I can't see. So I'm not seeing any people pop up, not just, not just men. So it's probably gonna be men and women. Right, so that's kind of a wash. We get that out of the way, um, but we we do just we do agree probably that it's high income people because again Rolex watches are not inexpensive. They're not like going down to um, to Walmart or Target and picking up a ten fifteen dollar watch that keeps good time, but it it doesn't have the brand appeal or. Uh, when you're wearing that Timex, people aren't going, ooh, look, she's got a Timex on. Ooh, wow, look, he's, he's got that really neat little swatch watch on or whatever, right? It's going to be more than $10 or $15. But anyway, so, so um, uh, Julia says maybe more men than women, maybe. But we're going to see in just a second Then Rolex makes, makes watches for women too. And uh, so, so Maxwell says status conscious. So let's talk a little bit about the... The, um, uh, let's, let's go with age next, kind of how old are people who, who wear Rolex watches? Are they 20-somethings, 30-somethings, 40-somethings? Does it matter? Could they be between, you know, 20 and 40 or 40 and up? What, what do you think? I've got 20, 35 or older, 40, 25 to 45, 35 to 65. Asia is a big market, 30 to 60, 40 and older, 30 and older. So, so age may or may not be a big part of this, but it, once we get to when we talk about price and how much these things cost, yeah, Julia says anyone who has the money. Many times it's people who have the money, which sometimes for us, when, unfortunately, when you're in your 20s, you got to pay rent. You got to eat your food. You may not have uh, the type of income that you can afford a Rolex. Now, maybe somebody gifts you a Rolex when you graduate from the University of Mary Washington. I don't know. Maybe that's your graduation gift. So that's a little different. But we're talking about people who want to purchase it themselves, I guess, because that's who we're trying to reach at this point. So probably older, I don't know, 40, 40 and up, because at that point, you've probably reached an income level in your career that you can afford it as a discretionary purchase. It's, you know, you got maybe a mortgage payment and a car payment and, and you're paying for your kids to, to do all the activities that they do and keep them clothed and fed and all that. And you do a vacation or so every year, but you've got a little extra money and you, somebody said earlier in the chat, you, you're status conscious. You're, you're, you're all about letting people know that, hey, I've made it. And wearing a Rolex sometimes says that to the world. So the um, target market is probably going to be men and women, maybe more men, maybe not who um, probably are in their 40s or older, probably even older is a better um, market. And then um, who, who care about people, what people think about them, who wanna show the world that, hey, I've made it, I've made it. So um, we kind of got that. We talked, some of you put things in the chat about what type of jobs that these people have. What do you do to make that kind of money? And you gave a lot of different um, examples of everything from uh, professional athletes to, to business executives to whatever. It's probably going to be more in terms of thinking of a target market. This uh, target market doesn't mean that we won't sell to somebody who's not in our target market. I mean, again, somebody made the point, anybody who has money, we, we'd probably sell the, the watch to, but 
trying to reach with our marketing efforts is probably people who are um, executives and companies or maybe lawyers or maybe um, physicians who, again, who have that type of money and who might have the need to sh share with the world that, hey, look, I've made it. Um, that doesn't mean we won't sell it to a professional athlete, but you start thinking about how big the professional athlete market is. It's, you know, if you think about one of these, um, you know, the, the, even the green is our smallest little thing here. The professional athletes market is like this big over here. It's like a little pinprick. So if I do all my marketing efforts to try to reach LeBron or you know, anybody else who's a professional athlete, it's a really infinitesimal uh, part of the, of the world. So think more broadly about, okay, who else could, who, who do it? A bigger market would be business executives, lawyers, attorney, uh, uh, physicians, um, those type of people. Does that make sense? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of screens here, but does that make sense? If it does, then we can move on. Thumbs up if you if that makes sense. Some of you, thank you, Adam. You're, you're one of the only people I can see. Um, thank you, Paul. Yeah, Maddie. Uh, yeah, those of you, Ellie. Thank you. Okay, so um, so again, we could spend a lot of time uh, drilling down into this and all, but we don't have you know hours to spend on this whole little lecture. So we're gonna think about um, other things. Obviously, status conscious, older men and women, executive types, or people who probably wear suits a lot to work back in the day when we were going into the office all the time. And we will get back to that um, at, at some point on, on some type of ba limited basis anyway. So people who, who really want to show the world that they've made it. So let's go on. Oh, I'm having trouble with my thing here. So, so we have four Ps. The first P, and some of you've had, I know, some uh, business classes in high school and you know all of this. The first P is product. And I've shown you two Rolex watches here. One of the, the one on the uh, right is a woman's watch and the one on the left is a man's watch. And um, the, uh, when we think about product, yes, what we see in front of us is the product, but product is also anything intangible related to um, that product as well. So um, we, we forget sometimes products are also services. So um, just as an aside, if you go down this afternoon to your local haircut place and get a haircut, that haircut is actually, it's a service, but it's a product. That person who's cutting your hair is performing a service for you and then you are going to pay that person for the service been, that's been provided. So products can be services or products or a combination of both. So in our case here, this is our beautiful Rolex. These are our beautiful Rolex watches. Now, a watch is a watch, right? I mean, I mentioned a Timex. Timex watches keep time. Many of us wear Timex watches. Many of us wear low end, if you will, watches, right? So. What is different about a Timex versus a Rolex? What, why would I spend lots more money buying a Rolex watch when I could go to, to Walmart and get a Timex for a lot less money and it's going to keep time? Would somebody unmute yourself and, and, and say it versus me having to read all this chat stuff? The legacy behind Rolex is it was like a Gold War, it was like a war type watch. Like a lot of people with I'm having so more of like a tradition. I'm having trouble understanding you. Oh, sorry, uh, I'll type it. <laughs> it wasn't your accent. It was the it was the connection. Uh, well, I'm I'm driving at the moment, but it's like the tradition of the Rolex watch, where like a lot of like British sold them off the Germans during the war. Yeah. And like a lot of British people have like old time Rolex watches from where like their grandparents have like stolen it or found it and that was just like two investments sure sure and so oh, somebody asked does having cell phones affect the number of people who want watches uh probably young people but people in our target market probably not because again the watch is something that means something different the rolex watch means something different than being just a watch but the other point is the um 
what I'm seeing, and I have children in their 20s, my children did not wear watches until they became adults. When they, when they went to work, because you're not, I mean, I've got my phone here. You're not expected to have your phone out all the time, you know, glued to you like we, we do a lot of times as, as young people. So you, you do start wearing a watch a lot of times after college because that's kind of the adult thing to do. Not always, but, but a lot of them do. So um, yeah, the, so why would um, a Rolex be more expensive than a Timex? I mean, what is it? It's a watch. Why would it be a whole lot more expensive? Well, because the, the people who make a Rolex, it's like craft, it, it's like a craft item. It's handmade. If there's no assembly line, it's not like going down a factory, you know, factory assembly line where, where each little part is put in and you know gets to the end, and you've got a you got a nice little watch. It individuals hand craft this thing. And they spend hours putting it together versus, I mean, you think about the one on the right here with those diamonds. You know, that is, um, that's just the exterior. Think about what the interior looks like. There's quite the um, mechanism inside that is, is very different in a lot of ways, but same in others to a Timex. And so when we get to price in just a second, part of the price that, that is offered is not just because um, oh, it's a luxury item and people expect to pay more and therefore they'll pay more because everybody knows that they paid more to get a Rolex. A lot of it is because of the time it takes to make it, right? So the product here, it's, it's the visual, what you see, what you feel. If you were at a local uh, uh, jewelry store and were able to hold it, it's how it feels. It, it's, it how, it's how it makes you feel when you put it on your wrist and you go, oh, wow. I feel like I've made it. I feel like I, if I get this, I am um, sharing with the world that I have, I've made it, right? And people are going to notice that about me. Um, if you don't really care about that, you might not think that the price was worth it, right? You might say, eh, it's just a watch. I mean, I, I'm not spending that kind of money on a watch when I can get one for hundred bucks or less that does, you know, more or less the same thing, right? So think about the product as being very broad in terms of um, not just the, the, the looks and whatever, but, but taking that thing apart and every little feature on it means something. Uh, I teach professional selling and I tell my students that if you're in a sales call and all you say is a fact or a feature about a product, I would hope that that, that person across the table from you would say to you in not so many words, but in some form of, so what? So if I said, um, this is a, um, the one on the left, this is a watch that has um, a, um, a, a date on it. Okay, why do I care about that? So what? So this has a date on it. And you said earlier that you needed to, to, to be able to, at a glance to see what day it is when you're, you know, signing uh, contracts, you're a lawyer, you wanna sign contracts, you wanna look down and be able to see, this one has that date. And so when you'd be able to just look quickly at your watch and, and figure it out versus having to look up a calendar or on your phone or something like that. So you're gonna tie things together. So all of these uh, watches have features. They have things that they, you know, the, the tangible things here, a minute hand, um, you know, diamonds, yellow gold, white gold, whatever, it has features, but who cares? So you'd want to learn to, to tell about that as well. So, but really um, the Rolex also has that way it makes you feel. Now there are people who buy Timex watches who feel proud that they bought a Timex because they saved money. They're not luxury brand item people. They want to say to the world, look, I'm a frugal person. I can get it done with a product that, you know, doesn't cost me an arm and a leg. And I'm proud of that, right? So some of, there's different people in the world, that's not our target market. Our target market is the people who wanna be seen with the income to be able to do it, the disposable income to do it, all right? Next. Okay, the second thing is distribution. So I've put on here uh, three different places that you could buy watches. 
And um, distribution is all about, in, in the four Ps, we call it place because, you know, three Ps and a D doesn't have the same kind of ring to it as four, P do, four Ps does. And it's not as easy to remember. So place is, you know, we're making our watch in some factory somewhere or in some uh, shop or craftsman's village or whatever somewhere. And it's got to get to a place where you can find it, where you can access it easily. So for example, in Rolex, you know, if, if we're making Rolex watches and let's say they're all made in Switzerland at a, at a, at a, a big building there, uh, you don't have to go to Switzerland, make the trip there to get the Rolex watch. It's going to come to you. But I've given you three different choices here because one of the things as a product manager you've got to do is think like that luxury brand person. The person who wants to buy a Rolex, where do they expect to be able to find it? So let's say that after the session today that you go to Target and you walk in Target and right there, at the, you know, they've got this big display right ahead of you, right after you get your buggy. And it says Rolex watches, $10. And there's a whole, you know, display for, full of them. What are you thinking? When you see Rolex watches for $10 at Target, it's fake. Not real Rolexes, cheap, right? So, so as a brand manager, you're gonna try to think like that person who, who um, is going to, who's in your target market, where do they expect to see the Rolexes, right? And Target, if you went in there, even if they were real and you were selling them for $10, all of us, whether we're in the target market or not, would go, that's inconsistent because Rolex watches are expensive, why are they at Target for $10? It would be very confusing to you, right? So you would either think they're fake or counterfeit, or you'd be really confused about why would Target be selling them for $10 because they're losing a bunch of money on this and you know, whatever. So, so you're, you, you've got to think as a product manager, you've got to think, okay, where do people in my Target market that I've identified earlier, where are they gonna shop? Well, do they shop at Belk? Do people who have high incomes that are older, that uh, work as executives or physicians or lawyers or whatever, who have status, uh, who like to show their kind of status off, do they shop at Belk? No, they wouldn't. I'm sorry? I said no, they wouldn't. So, so never go to Belk if you're a person who has who has um, money. You could, I just, I feel that um, somebody with that amount of income would spend more of their time at more luxury retailers, more, um, maybe some more expensive retailers. Good answer, Chris. Yeah, probably going to spend play their, their time and money other places, but they might shop at Belt too. I mean, they might go to Belt for one or two items that they can't get anywhere else and that they grew up wearing or, or purchasing. Um, ladies, they might go there to, to buy makeup, you know, because they, it's, it's a convenient way to do it, right? But typically for most of our products, they're gonna say, nah, I'm gonna take a pass on Belk. I'm not gonna buy my clothing there. I might go in and check, I saw a sale for their shoes. Maybe I'll go in and buy shoes there, but eh, probably not. That's not my kind of, um, go-to place for most of the products I buy. So if I'm a product manager for Rolex and I'm thinking, okay, where would the person think, think that they should be able to find Rolex? That's not consistent with my, my product, my um, target audience, right? So yeah, probably not gonna be at Belk. Cause if you went to Belk, even if they had a, had a um, let's say that we, we, we sold some uh, Rolex watches at Belk. We decided, you know, we'll let them carry it because, you know, they're, they're making a, pl a plea for them and they're telling me, oh yeah, we've got people who will buy them. The odds are we'll sell it to Belk and they won't be able to, to sell, but maybe one or two because few people are going to think about Belk for their Rolex watches. So they're gonna be stuck with that inventory and that's not, not what we want either. And so the other option I put on here is called something called Crown Jewelers, which is a local high-end jewelry store here in Fredericksburg. Uh, you, most of you probably don't live in Fredericksburg, so, but, it, but you probably have, if you live in any 
similar sized or larger city, you have a crown jeweler equivalent in your, in your neighborhood or your, your town or city. And so crown jewelers, again, carries a lot of high end products because you know, they carry the diamonds. It's probably in Fredericksburg, one of the places you might go to, to purchase an engagement ring. It's the place you would go to buy that diamond pendant for your, for your wife when, on your you know, 25th wedding anniversary or something like that. So it's got some high end things. It's got some things for you know, um, younger people and, and, um, and, and their you know, kids in their 20s, whatever. But if for Rolex watches locally, Crown Jewelers is probably a place that you think, yeah, if I'm the person in that target market in, in this Fredericksburg, Virginia area, I'm probably going to Crown to check them out. And so right before we got online today, just to make sure, I went online and yes, Crown Jewelers does have Rolex watches because that's where people who, who meet our target market credentials would go. And they expect to see it at a high-end jewelers and yes, it's there. So you as a brand manager, your product manager, you've got to be thinking, um, where do we put our products? And high-end jewelry stores is probably kind of the, the place. So we're gonna move on because I'm watching my time here. The next P is price. And so, you know, one of the things that a lot of um, people don't think too much about when they put prices on things is how much does it cost to manufacture a product? And I mentioned earlier that a Rolex watch is, 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 a, is done by, by hand, it's individually done. So it takes many, 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 many hours to, to make a watch, to put together a watch. And so that factors in because, you know, I've got to pay that craftsman to, for his time, his or her time. It's not going to be just, oh, well, let me give you a couple of hundred bucks. I mean, I, it, it's going to take a lot of time. And so, and these people are highly paid because again, they're making a product that is expected to, to last forever, right? Um, so we're going to have to build in the cost to manufacture the product, both to make it and do the distribution and all that. And then we figure out kind of what is the manufacturer's suggested retail price. And Rolex watches are not something that you see on sale. It, you, don't, you don't see, um, you know, even, even at Crown Jewelers or places like that, you don't see, you know, half price off kind of thing, right? That's not because that would diminish the brand. You expect to pay a lot and you pay a lot. So if we go back to this picture, how much do you think these watches would cost? Re manufacturer suggested retail price. This is the price that you, the person in the target market might pay if you went into Crown Jewelers and said, hey, I'm looking for the, the watch on the left versus the watch on the right. How much, give me some, some ballparks. You're probably looking at like three thousand dollars, because. Okay, the the one on the left might be three thousand dollars. Because it's about one thousand five hundred pound here, because I, I kind of um, got okay. addiction to Rolex. It's like I, I look at them all the time. Okay, so so it will depend on kind of um, how complex these watches are, for sure. I mean, the the one on the left is a lot less pricey. It will be priced a lot less than the one on the right, because. Look at all those diamonds. They're not just on the face of the watch, they're on the circle around the face and then they're on the band. So it's gonna be cha-ching, right? So I've got lots of things in the chat. Let me go back to the chat. I think the one on the right could definitely go for upwards of $10,000 easily. Well upwards from that. <laughs> Way upwards, yeah, yeah. yeah. That was, uh, so, so with the diamonds, um, it's gonna be at least $20,000. So- <laughs> So you start thinking about, well, remember the one on the left, if it's probably three to 5,000, probably more in the $5,000 range uh, here in the States, but, um, but you've got all that intricate workmanship inside, that's still the same thing on the right, but, but there's much more wow factor to the one on the right, right? All those diamonds. Um, so, uh, so it really depends. You, if you, after we're off today, go off and, and, and Google and see what Rolex watches go for. You can find them used on eBay. You can find them, you know, whatever. But, uh, and many of them are heirlooms. They've been passed down from, you know, father to son, mother to daughter, 
in families for generations because they are special. I mean, they're, they're one of those things that, you know, if you've got one, you want to keep it, right, in the family and all. So, um, so the price point is really has a lot more to do with um, what's involved in making the product and, and um, the craftsmanship and then also the, the you know, the, all the stuff with it, like in this case, the diamonds. Um, and remember too, as a product manager, you're, you're trying to think it inside your target market's head. And they're, they want, some of them want kind of flashy and ostentatious and like, look at me. I walked into, when I was in graduate school, um, one day I walked into my dissertation advisor, which you have to write a big paper at the end of your PhD program. It's all research and all. And this was my guy who was my, my uh, number one uh, person that I worked with on that. And I walked in his office one day and he, he was sitting behind his desk and he stood up and he, he kind of, you know, did like this a little bit and, and he said, notice anything different? And I looked at him and I, you know, I, I looked at his face. I'm thinking, you know, no, you haven't done anything with your hair that I can tell or you haven't shaved off your mustache or, you know, so I'm looking at him like, and I kind of looked at his body and I, I was like, I'm sorry, I don't know anything. And then he kind of did this again. And I said, no, still nothing. And his, his watch had, you know, jiggled out at the bottom. And he goes, and he shows me and he had a Rolex. And I said, oh, wow. <laughs> he had just turned 40 and his wife bought him this Rolex for his 40th birthday present. Because, you know, 40 was significant and, and they could afford it. And evidently he had always wanted one and because he wanted the world to know he had made it. So I was duly you must have been like, so, like You must've been so excited to come into work. Like, oh, I'm going to be the talk of the office. They're going to envy me and they, the, my, my wife is the best. Hey, you notice anything different? Nope. Really? Well, and part, of the, yeah, <laughs> part of the problem was it was October and he had a sweater on, you know, so, it, so the watch was underneath his cuff a little bit. And that's why he was trying to get it to shake out. So I could see it, but I wasn't noticing the shaking out. I was just kind of noticing the looking at his face. You know how people wanted uh, anyway. So, but yeah. I was, what are you doing with your body? Why are you shaking? <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I was like, nope, don't get it here. So I was duly impressed. I was like, Ooh, wow. Ooh, <laughs> I made a big nice. deal about it and all, but, um, and people do that. You know, they want to be noticed. And, and many people who, who wear Rolexes wear it for that reason. Many people just wear it because it's a really good watch and it will last generations and they see it as an investment. So you don't, I don't want you to walk away from this lecture assuming that, oh, well, of course, if you buy a Rolex, you're all about flash and spark and ooh, everybody's going to notice me. Some people really see them as an investment. And then, and then um, like Ben said, um, many, many generations pass them down and they, they're special because grandma owned this or grandpa owned this, or, you know, they got it in a special place for a special reason. So it's not all equal. We're simplifying a lot of stuff here today because we've got, you know, 50 minutes. So, so you don't see them on, uh, the Rolex will probably from the factory, the, the, the home office, they're probably going to suggest the price and they don't want you deviating. Because if Crown Jewelers start sell, sells them um, for you know uh, three fourths of the price, um, that messes up the market for all Rolexes because people get confused. Well, why are they being sold at a bargain price at Crown when you know up in uh, uh, Northern Virginia you can't get it for for that price, and Richmond you can't get, it. Virginia Beach, everywhere else it's the you know whatever. So they want to keep the price points uh, pretty strong. So you might not have as much of a as a product manager, you may not have as much of a um, uh, leeway in pricing your product as you would in many other products if you were a product manager. Like if you were pricing Tide detergent or something like that, you might have a little bit more leeway. All right, the last P is promotion. Now I've put a bunch of ways to promote your product up here. And what I'd like to do, because we've got limited time, but what I'd like to do is, is go through each one of these things and I want you to think about our target market, which we've already defined, and which one of these would work for that target market. And then we'll drill down a little bit. So for example, we'll just start at the top left-hand corner and we'll just go across and around. So magazines, 
You know, I've got you know several magazines on here. Uh, with the people in our target market, again, higher income, older, male, male and female, um, people who kind of like some flash and 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 um, and show, it, look, I've made it. Would they? Would, do they read magazines? I mean, I can only, I can say the only time I read magazines. This is this is. Uh pre-COVID would be at like, you know, a spa or something when I'm waiting like for maybe five minutes. I'm like, oh, a People magazine. I don't read that. It's more on the phone and like, you know, the news app notification, like right in your face. So, so would they have subscriptions at their house though? Would I get a subscription, let's say to Time Magazine or, or something like that? I wouldn't say so. No. I'm sorry? I wouldn't say so, no. Quite a lot of people like, it's like phones at the moment. So like, more to more like social media wise, I'd say. Okay, so so whereas maybe 20 years ago, this might have been a really good place to promote our product in some certain types of magazines. Today, maybe not so much. Now, the good news is if you're a brand manager or product manager, you've done a lot of research. So for example, if you wanted to advertise in Time Magazine, you could go to them. They can tell you the demographic and psychographic, which is kind of lifestyle, uh, attributes, they can tell you the demographic, demographic and psychographic attributes of the people who are subscribers to Time Magazine. Now they can tell you our average, our, our, our population that, that subscribes is between the ages of X and Y, it's mostly men, it's you know people with this kind of income level, they can tell you a lot of that stuff. So if you have a, a lot of money, Remember, I said you don't have a lot of money. You have a limited budget, just like any product manager would. But if you have a, if you had enough money, you might say, "Wow, well, time kind of reaches my target market, so maybe I would invest in in promoting my product there." But um, the world's changing, and magazines are not what they used to be in terms of for for promotion purposes, for advertising purposes. So um, uh, circulations and subscriptions have gone down. And even if, remember too, even if you did. Uh, use Time Magazine for your ad. Um, we know who the subscribers are, but we don't know who the people who just pick it up at the newsstand are, right? You go to you go to um, big cities and you see a lot of newsstands and people go in and pick up their magazines or newspapers there. They don't have subscriptions. So you might be picking, people who are in your target market might actually read it, but may not be in the subscriber base. So again, different world today, but you know, 20, 30 years ago, this would have probably been a place that you would have used, but we've kind of moved on. Next is as seen on TV. So do people in our target market watch TV? And, and, and if so, what, what kinds of uh, programs should we use to um, purchase time on, airtime on, to promote our Rolex watch? Well, you're definitely not going to want had to have maybe like like diamonds a diamonds ad after like uh, a cooking show. So you definitely want to get the right network. Um, maybe something like Hallmark, like a romantic like run, like get your get your you know spouse or something this beautiful stuff like this beautiful Rolex. So I. I can say personally for me, I don't watch TV as much as I used to because of just the, uh, I can watch 30 minutes of content on YouTube with maybe 30 seconds of, of ads in between it. Instead, I can watch maybe 10 minutes of TV shows with five minutes of uh, commercials in there. It's just not worth it anymore. But as I, as my parents, you know, as I get older, yeah, I, I watch Hallmark, but I can't get it anywhere else. So yeah, I would say it doesn't have to be the best target. Yeah, it's a different world today. I mean, um, with all of the kind of flip from network TV to more the Netflix type of, of shows, the flip from uh, network TV to YouTube. I mean, it's, it's real different. Think of who your target market is though. It's not you. There's also... Ellie. There's also um, like a lot of groups um, like collect information. So they'd be able, like if you're using more YouTube or more Netflix or whatever source you're using to get your content, they're like collecting a lot of your data so they could advertise 
and target people specifically that way instead of picking like Time Magazine or just advertising generally on Facebook, they could target to specific people. Yeah, so, so what you're gonna find out, you're all exactly right. Think about who your target market is. When you are 45 to 65, this may not be re relevant anymore. But today, um, when is the Masters Golf Tournament? Is it in like a week or so? I think it's, it's coming up in a week or so. I'm pretty sure Rolex is one of the three sponsors for the Masters Golf Tournament. And so you will see, if you watch that golf tournament, again, who, who, who watches the Masters Golf Tournament? People who are in our target market, men especially, but women do too. And so if you watch that, that, um, uh, that golf tournament for four days, especially the last two days, you will see a heck of a lot of, of Rolex watch uh, ads on there because it's a captive audience. People get captured by the Masters Golf Tournament. And, and so you're probably not going to see Rolex uh, ads on any other show for a lot of the reasons that you just said. And because, of course, we have limited dollars. But evidently, because of the um, impact that years and years and years of advertising as part of the, um, as on the Masters has had on them, because of course they track this, right? They know that after they, after April, when they have the Masters, sales for Rolex watches spike. People go, oh yeah, I should get, oh, graduations are coming up. Um, anniversaries are coming up. You know, a lot of people get married in June, right? All these things are coming up and, and sales spike. And so that's why their research tells them advertising on the master still works for them. Again, maybe when you're that age, maybe it doesn't. Maybe we won't even have Rolex watches anymore. Maybe people will just say, I'm done with you know, high-end watches. We can't afford them. But probably not because it's much more about um, the way it makes you feel and the message it sends to the world than it is about the watch uh, the, that it tells time that it you know, keeps the best time in the world or whatever kind of thing, all right? I wonder wh who actually bought a Rolex because like, I need a practical watch. I, I never know what time it is. I'm going to get a Rolex. <laughs> I, feel, I don't, I don't, I don't can't think of a single person who's done that. Well, there are, um, I, I have my kids, none of my kids had um, watches until after college and they were like, oh my gosh. But again, they can't afford a Rolex and their mother's not going to buy them one because she's like, no, not not kind of spend five thousand dollars on a watch at this point. I don't have one. Look at look look at a clock. There's some yeah. there's oh. there's one around here somewhere. Again, there's Timex too. <laughs> so there's a hundred dollar watch. My Seiko here. I got it for my twenty fifth uh, birthday. I'm old. I've oh, got still I've got twenty five year old children. Yeah. So I mean, it's, oh. it's an old watch, but it still works. I get a new battery every every time the battery dies. Right. So. All right, quickly, we're moving around. So uh, billboards, probably not because, you know, you could put a billboard up on in our local area, I-95, and a lot of people who are in our target market are probably zooming up and down 95, but not enough of them to make it worth the investment in a billboard, right? To, to say, look, Rolex, big, shiny diamonds, whatever. It'd be pretty ostentatious and people go, and, and a lot of people could afford it who are in this area but probably not worth the investment. Um, Facebook advertising, different kind of thing than you know, 10 years ago, we didn't have Facebook advertising. Today, it's there. Again, thinking of your target market, you may say, hmm, probably not, but maybe. Maybe if you click on another luxury brand item, then, then Facebook ad pops up for Rolex watch. I've not clicked on a luxury brand item. I don't know uh, that it would pop up, but probably not. Radio advertising, eh, probably not. Again, how, who would you, uh, which radio station would only, would, would it make sense to invest and purchase the, the airtime to only reach our target market? Maybe some kind of talk radio or whatever, but probably not, right? Um, the, the, the one at the bottom is uh, promotions. Um, this is this is an ad in a newspaper, uh, old ad, obviously. But the idea is that in a newspaper, well, maybe think Wall Street Journal, think New York Times. People who have subscriptions to those types of um, newspapers might be perfect for our target audience. And I would not be a bit surprised if, if Rolex does not do occasional advertising with with those type of um, newspapers. Now. 
A big issue today, though, in, in your lifetime, they may go away totally, is newspapers are dying. The newspaper industry is dying. You know, my dad lives in Bur near Birmingham, Alabama, and it used to be, when I was a kid, there was a morning newspaper and an afternoon newspaper. So you subscribe to one or the other. Then the, the afternoon newspaper went out of business. You only had the morning. Now that morning is down to three days a week. Right, so they don't even deliver every day. And this is Birmingham, Alabama, which is not, it's a city somewhat like Richmond. It's not a small city by any means or small town by any means. So, so newspapers are shrinking. So who knows the future of newspapers? And then the uh, bus. Can you imagine seeing a Rolex watch uh, thing zooming through Washington DC or New York? Eh, probably not. So, but, and, and this is not all of the options, but these are kind of some of the major options. But I wanted to at least get you thinking about, okay, think about my target market. What are they doing? Where are they spending their time? And, and, and why did, uh, I didn't mention this, but why TV for the, for the masters? Because a lot of these people in our target market probably play golf or do things like that. And so they kind of find that as an appeal. So that's why they would do the, the, the um, the uh, master's golf tournament, if you will. All right. So this is what our marketing strategy is. It's all about figuring out our target market and then putting together a plan for our product place, price and promotion to, to reach that target market. Again, I mentioned earlier, we're not saying that we would never um, sell to somebody outside of our target market. If you, 18 years old, 17 years old, had ah, $5,000 in spare change and said, I'm going to go down to Crown Jewelers or my local jewelry store because you know what? I'm graduating from high school and I am going to invest in a Rolex watch because, you know, they would sell it to you. They wouldn't say, oh, I'm sorry, you're not old enough. You, you don't have the type of title that we need, that, that we're looking for. They would sell it to you. But as a product manager, you, the 17 year old with money in your pocket are not in the target market. We, we need to figure out for the big, biggest part of the market we can, how to reach those people and how to put together a product place price promotion strategy to get to them. All right, we did it. We did it all. <laughs> and I'm gonna stop share and see what questions you have in our last couple of minutes, either about this topic or about the College of Business that I can answer to help you make a decision if you have not yet made a decision. Nobody? What can I tell you about the College of Business? Do we have any law classes? Yes. Um, every business student takes a law class. It's, it's a Business Law 201 that is required for all business majors. And then we also have, um, let's see, we have an intro to sports law. These are, the others are electives. Intro to sports law, a cybersecurity law, which is actually a part of the a requirement for the um, cybersecurity major over in the computer science department. And then there's, um, I think, commercial law. So yes, we have several law classes. And, and Professor Kinsley, um, she's a lawyer, she would. Uh, she is the pre-law advisor for the campus. So even if you're a political science major or something else on campus major, she is a person that um, would be a. If, if you thought you might want to go to law school one day, she can kind of uh, advise you about what things to take and how to prepare for that. What are some um, main classes you would take as a marketing major your freshman year um, that um, specializes in that marketing field? You can't take any marketing classes your freshman year. So, so the business major for all business majors, um, the first year we recommend that you take two accounting, principles one and two, which are financial and managerial accounting, and then two economics classes, macro and micro, and then a, a, a stats, um, math statistics class. If you take those five classes your first year and make a 2.5 GPA in those five classes, which is at least three Bs and two Cs or better, if you think about it that way, then you can be admitted to the business major. Then you start taking, it's kind of a sequential thing. Then you would take your business law class, your management information systems class, you know, and then about late sophomore, early junior year, you take your principles and marketing class, which is something, this class, that, this mock thing that we did today, 
you would talk about this type of stuff. And then in your junior and senior year, you would take marketing electives. Well, not marketing classes. There are three. If you were a marketing major, you would take three required classes, consumer behavior, market research, and marketing strategy. And then you would take three other classes, elect, marketing electives, to complete your marketing major. Does that make sense? And, and so the five classes the first year applies for everybody. Doesn't matter what you want to major in in business, but um, you would have to earn your way into the business school. Uh, let's see. Do we get to learn about different business internships? Um, pretty much you can do, if you're an accounting student, you can do an accounting internship. If you're a marketing student, you could do a digital marketing internship or a, an analyst position or something like that. We we help you find internships. And then sometimes you bring internship opportunities to us. And so we work with you. We do over, well, pre-COVID, we do over a hundred internships annually in the business school. So that's that's really good for our number of students we have. International business program, it looks like, well, every student, no matter what your major, accounting, marketing, international business or business administration takes the same core. So you take all, I call it the principles of classes. So you take some accounting, some marketing, some economics, some finance, some information systems, some management, um, law, you miss, everybody takes that same core, business communication, right? And then you choose. And so if, you, um, if you're an international business major, you do more with international courses. So we have like an international marketing major, we have a course, international marketing course, an international business course, you are also expected to have some type of study abroad experience. That has been challenging this last year. So we've had to make some accommodations for our international business majors, but hopefully getting back to whatever the new normal is, you'll be able to study abroad again. So international business is a great major and, and um, some of our top students choose that because it requires a little extra to, to study abroad. Um, let's see, I'm, I'm trying to catch up with my chat here. Math classes, no calculus, you would take math statistics. That's all for the business major, which sometimes that makes people really happy. So no, you don't have to be good at math to study business. <laughs> um, the, the, the most challenging math that you're gonna find in, in business classes is gonna be finance, but you can do it. You will be well prepared to do it. Um, took macro, or AP macro and get credit. That will count as college credit. Yeah, so, so we'll, you'll need to check and see what you, what uh, if you take AP classes in college, any classes, whether it's economics or anything else, if you take them in high school and you take the test and um, if you make three or above, you get credit, college credit is my understanding. If you make a four or a five, you get specific college credit. So if you took AP macro and made a four or five, you would not have to take um, the macroeconomics class here at Mary Washington. It would, it would count for that. But if you made a three, you would have to take it because basically that says uh, you didn't get enough knowledge to, to, to go forward without it. So, um, but you would still get three hours of college credit. So I know that can kind of be confusing, but um, how many students are in business at Mary Washington? So again, you have to earn your way into business. So there are about 400 declared majors who've earned their way in, and they're anywhere between 150 to 200 who are in that trying to get earn their way in. And, and I should say to you, every semester we have students who do not earn their way in, and then they come begging. Oh, but I've got a 2.4 in those five classes. No, it's 2.5. And that's a faculty decision, and the dean's office just enforces that. Um, Top employers for graduates of UMW School of Business. Well, I was just having this conversation with somebody yesterday. If you're an accounting student, the big four accounting firms love our, our graduates and Deloitte and KPMG are probably our, um, they, they do the most recruiting of those big four. And if you can get hired on a big four, big four firm, you have said to the world, I'm pretty good because they don't, they don't hire you if you're not pretty good. Um, we have a lot of students who go work out in contracting jobs uh, Dahlgren, the naval base east of here, hires a lot of our graduates. Um, the Marine Corps Systems Command to do kind of contracting jobs hires a lot of our graduates. GEICO, uh, people like GEICO. Now, many people have a, a, a misunderstanding about GEICO because they, um, they think it's all about the, you know, the sales and all. 
Geico is a big business. They have accounting jobs. They have HR jobs. They have, you know, jobs all over the place. So a lot of people go there. And I'm running out of time. I, I see that Natalie's put in here. We have another session. If you want to talk more, email me. I'm going to put my, my um, uh, information in the chat. And uh, we also have three night events this week. I hope that you got maybe an email from me early or Thursday about them. We're doing a, a nonprofits thing on Tuesday night. And we have May 2020 graduates come on Thursday night that are gonna be, uh, they're gonna tell about their transition to the workplace and all that. So if you're interested in attending those, those are at seven o'clock on Thursday, Tuesday and Thursday night, email me and I'll send you the Zoom link. Thank you all for being here today. And um, I hope you're coming. If you, raise your hand if you know you're coming. You know you're coming, yay, Paul's coming. Christopher's coming. Well, I don't know how to raise my hand. So, but if, if you can, if I can answer any more questions, let me know. Have a great Saturday, folks. If you've still got questions, I'm happy to hang out with you. Um, um, in the English track, if your major is creative writing. Yes. In your, okay, I'm talking. I don't know if you're a business professor or what, but if your major is in creative writing, um, and did you declare that in the third year? Or did you declare, declare your major in the first year? So business, you have to earn your way into the business school. You have to finish those five classes I was talking about. But every right. other major on campus, you can declare after you've completed 28 hours of college credit. Okay. So you know, if you have AP or dual enrollment or something like that, you may bring in, I don't know, 15 hours. You might be able to declare after the first semester. It just that's the, the bellwether for everything else. Okay, okay. great. Thank you. Thank you.